1 Samuel chapter 18, we do have a number of verses in various portions, but uh, it'll behoove us to open ahead of time to 1 Samuel chapter 18. It's page 293 in my Bible. Is yours? Forget it. You know, I'm just a side note, thankful to see people using Bibles. I've been in enough churches where Bibles aren't even in the pews and there are two big screens up there and, and all the scriptures up there. And what do you do during the week? <laughs> you know, how do you know even where anything is uh, in your Bible if you don't know how to use it? Let's pause for a word of prayer. Father, thank you as we pause in this worship hour on this Lord's Day evening to honor you by proclaiming truth from your word. It's not the words of your servant, but it's your words, Father, and may we handle it with the love and care that it deserves. And may it indeed be seed that is sown upon good soil to produce abundant fruit for your glory. Thank you, Father, for its work, for all that it provides unto us, nourishment, satisfaction, and light. May it even be so tonight, in Christ's name. Amen. Immediately following my hip surgery, both of them actually, the next day I was up, out of bed, and using a walker. And they said, you have to learn to walk again. You have to use this. And I was hesitant the first time around, and the second time a little more bold in doing it. But I needed that walker until the muscles were restrengthened again, until they were pulled back into place, until they were in, in a certain situation. After probably two weeks or so, I adjusted from the walker to a cane, and eventually without a cane at all. Um, I needed a, a crutch. I needed uh, something to lean upon. I needed something to help me uh, along the way in life, uh, to support my body, else I would fall. And I think it's true in life. There are many emotional and physical and even spiritual crutches, uh, canes, things that are there to lean upon. And I don't mean this in a bad sense. Um, you see, everyone leans upon somebody or something throughout our life, oftentimes more than others. We all have a well-developed system of this in place, and we depend upon people. And when that person goes, uh, when that person moves, or when that company, or that whatever it is, moves out of the way, we sometimes find ourselves tripping a little bit because we've relied upon that all too often. But God did not save us that we could rest ourselves on others or on things, but that we would learn to rest ourselves upon Him more and more as we grow in an understanding of Him. We learn to grow in an absolute, utter dependence upon our God, to lean upon Him and Him alone. And when He sees His children leaning upon everyone or anyone else but Him, we can count His teaching us lessons that we need to learn. And I want to use the example of David tonight in that particular instance. I see this principle in the work of David, the writer of Psalms, king of Israel, the slayer of giant. I want to spend some time in the early chapters of the scriptures here and show us how David taught us a lesson that he was to learn upon, to lean solely upon the Lord. I want us to learn this truth by seeing what God had done in his life. And again, leaning upon things, using crutches and so forth, isn't bad. But there's a place and a time for them, and a place and a time for them to be pushed out of the way. First, I want to look at some passages where I would describe it as David's support system being developed. In other words, as a young man growing up, uh, he gained a lot, but there was still much more in his life that had to be developed. Up to the early points of his life, as he moved into his relationship with Saul and the kingdom, uh, he had absolutely been a model of faith, of courage, of obedience, 
of integrity, of devotion to God, and devotion to his king. But he was still a very young man, and a long way from his home and his family, and therefore God did bring into his life uh, abilities or stability, so that God in his grace would have placed these things in there. Verse 13 of 1 Samuel 18 is the first one, and I refer to it as uh, David leaning upon his own position. Therefore Saul removed him from him and made him captain over thousands, and he went out and came in before the people. Um, a humble shepherd boy had now been pronounced captain over thousands of the armies of Israel because of what had taken place in this victory over the giant Goliath. He was chief musician in the court of Saul, and his work gave him stability in life. He was advancing from being the shepherd boy, the uh, low rung on the totem pole, as it were, as far as his brethren were concerned, and now he's a man who is in position over thousands. And this position gave him some stability. He needed it. He leaned upon it. And of course, it was part of the progress that helped David to move along in life that he would one day become king, and this was necessary for his progress. I don't want to refer to it as a stepping stone to the throne, but it was surely something that he could rely upon. He also relied upon his popularity. Look at down at verse 16 of that same chapter, 1 Samuel 18. But all Israel and Judah loved David because he went out and came in before them. The people loved David and respected him for what he had done and how he had conducted himself before the people. Uh, Saul indeed had his thousands, but David had his ten thousands. His popularity grew. Uh, the people recognized what a relationship this young man had with the Lord and was before them. And he learned that the support of the people were there. As, and I say it in a good sense, again, as a crutch, as something to lean upon to help him along the way in his life. And no doubt the praise of these people was just another assurance in his day that kingship was indeed true, even what God had promised through the prophet. Uh, there were others who were brought into his life, and I say this system is developed by his leaning upon other people, uh, God placing them in his wife, uh, Michal. Uh, Saul's daughter was given to David, and she genuinely loved this young man. They genuinely had a great relationship together, and I think no doubt David drew his strength in leaning upon the support of her love for him. Uh, it was a great relationship that profited uh, David in his walk. Uh, I think we would all say by common consent that Jonathan proved to be a faithful friend. Uh, as far as individuals were concerned in David's life, Jonathan was one that was a trusted relationship with David. Uh, he was David's eyes and ears in the throne room. Jonathan was placed uh, that friendship of higher than any other uh, with David, his allegiance to his father even so. David often leaned upon the support of this friendship with Jonathan. And I think a third one, which... Uh, maybe we wouldn't think so much of, but I think the prophet uh, Samuel. I think uh, his wife and Jonathan, but Samuel as the older, wiser man in, in David's life, God placed him there as a man who would give him strength uh, because of uh, David's sacrifice and service and worship. I think the relationship with the prophet was significant in those early years. It helped him to walk along and being there to help him and guide him in his leadership. Uh, the Lord also brought in this matter, and I say it in a good sense, uh, leaning upon his pride, David's pride in his life. Um, he had the, uh, the, the, the support of position and the people that were around him, the individuals and the whole crowds, but then the pride. Uh, verse 14, 1 Samuel 18, verse 14. And David behaved wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. Uh, David took pride in his life as he lived, and he knew how to carry himself before the Lord and before the people, before the congregation that was there. Uh, 
Uh, he probably placed a great deal of emphasis upon doing the right thing. He had a matter of self-respect and self-control and self-esteem that was balanced right in his life. Uh, his pride was a crucial part in the support system. And I think we need to be reminded that there's nothing wrong with the right kind of pride. There's a pride that does destroy and a pride that pulls us away from our relationship with our Lord. But a right kind of pride is a good thing. Let me stop here and thank the Lord for the support system that he's placed within each of our lives. Um, and I, again, I use the word crutch or cane or, or staff or whatever, but I mean it in a good sense. Usually it carries a negative connotation. But I ask these questions, where would we be without the love and support of a spouse, those who are married? Where would we be in, in, in life without the one that God had brought into our life to bring us along? Where would we be without the encouragement of friends? Think through our days, from our earliest days, those whom God has brought along, many of them not with us anymore. Uh, this man or this woman or this couple or this group, uh, encouragement that they brought into our lives. Where would we be without the fellowship and the reinforcement of the church, the body of believers? Sometimes we feel that we can be isolated and I can do it on my own, uh, but all too often, as in being in a position as a pastor, you see individuals who all of a sudden kind of wander away. You say, well, I just don't like those people, or I don't like what's going on, and so forth and so on, and yet they distance themselves not only from the church, but from the Lord, and it becomes tragic. The reinforcement and fellowship of the church. Where would we be without the guidance and the direction given to us from the Word of God? Talk about a crutch, talk about something to lean upon, to rest ourselves upon. Uh, where would we be without the benefit of all of these safety nets that God has placed in our life? I thank him for those props, those crutches, those things that he's given to us to lean upon in life. Because he knows the areas of our weakness, he knows our frailties, he knows our ups and downs, and he says, this person needs these things. Uh, this one, not necessarily so, but in our life, he's, he's done those things to bring in our life, and what a, what a joy and what a blessing, and I think all too often we've forgotten about them. His graciousness to supply such an adequate network of support for us, and that's what we try and carry on into the lives of others. So in David's life, there's a development of this, this support system, these things upon which he can lean and grow. But now there's a time in his life that changes, and it's a dismantling of this support system, and this is under the hand of God's guidance. God does allow a series of events to take place in David's life to, to destroy or to remove, to dismantle these props these uh, these support systems. Uh, one day David was on top of the world and next day he finds himself at the very bottom. David became a man who was hunted by his enemies, by the thoughts of death and hounded by destruction. Uh, let me read uh, 1 Samuel 20 verse 3. He, he sees himself, he says, but truly as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, there is but one step between me and death. Yeah, I mean, talk about the, the picture of despair and hopelessness. I'm one step away. This is, this is the situation that I find myself in. You see, God begins this process of systematically dismantling every piece of David's support system. Um, he loses his position of, of, of being what he was as far as general uh, tar in charge of the army. Saul looks at this young man and he no longer sees favor in him for what he has done, but he sees him as a threat. He says the people are listening to him rather than to me. They favor him rather than me. And all of a sudden, God comes along and he removes that support that David had leaned upon for some time. His popularity becomes next because as David moves on with what Saul had done, he's no longer captain of the armies. He's no longer in the public eye. He becomes relegated to just a matter of memory. So the people probably assumed that Saul would be successful in his attempts to take his life. So David not only loses position, but he loses popularity. 
those things which helped him, which built him up for so long and, and guided him along, and now all of a sudden they're removed. Props are pulled out. He lost his people. Uh, his wife deliberately walks away from David, and this relationship never becomes harmonious again. The relationship of this this woman who was there and loved him dearly all of a sudden just disappears. The relationship between uh, David and Jonathan, uh, they, they worked well, and then all of a sudden Jonathan says, for your life's sake you can no longer come around. Uh, I know what my father's doing. I know his attempts and so forth. We can't meet here again. So that's pulled away. And then David looks at the prophet Samuel and he says, because of your relationship with me, uh, your life is at stake. You know, we can't have this. So uh, one by one, the individuals, the, the, the large gatherings of people, the throngs who cheered him were there, and that's pulled out. And now God removes the individuals that were there and helping him along. Uh, it becomes uh, rather tragic. Uh, 1 Samuel 21, uh, 10 through 15. And here I see, I guess in a sense you could say that David loses his pride. Chapter 21, beginning at verse 10. And David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. And the servants of Achish said unto him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing one to another of him and dances, saying, Saul hath seen his thousands and David his ten thousands? And David laid up these words in his heart and was sore afraid of Achish, king of Gath. And he changed his behavior before them, and feigned himself mad in their hands, and scrabbled on the doors of the gate, and let spit fall down upon his beard. Then said Achish unto his servants, Lo, ye see the man is mad. Wherefore then hath he brought him unto me? Have I need of madmen? that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? He's reached the bottom. He's, he's groveling in, 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 in the mud, as it were. They recognize him as the one who had killed the, the champion, Goliath. And, and they knew the, that this man had been a threat. And David pulls on this, this grand uh, display of, of, of madness, uh, acting as a raving lunatic. And, and his pride is gone, pulled out from underneath him. Piece by piece, prop by prop, crutch by crutch, God removes each one from his life in order that he would not rely upon any of those, but ultimately... And this is the true reason every dream and every hope and every goal to be dashed at his feet in order that God would be the only crutch that he would lean upon, his only resting place. God this did, did this to David so that David would learn to lean upon the Lord, and not upon the other props that were constructed in his life. To teach David the great truth, that God's people should learn to lean upon the Lord, God systematically removed them one by one, taking away the things that he had relied upon in order that he would say or believe what he has been. I think it's a truth that we all have need to hear. All of us, all through life, have learned to lean upon things and other people as a system of support in our lives. We look to our parents when we're young, later on the teachers or schooling or friends. Then the prop becomes our job or our money or wherever we live and we learn to use these crutches to prop us up and we forget the very important truths of life. Uh, Millie and I were talking to a, a young lady, she's a nurse and, and uh, she professes Christ as her savior and we were talking in the, in the class about uh, various things and she says there was a time in my life when when I, I almost lost all my investments and my whole life was just crashing down and I says that is what you were resting your life upon your investments you know and uh, she says well yeah but I knew God was doing it. yeah but your eyes were still focused 
upon those crutches. Look what we are depending upon today. Look where our support is. Do you find yourself ever trusting in people or in things more than you have trusted in the Lord as your support? If so, that will not keep you from looking to the Lord to find his help. Our focus should be on the vertical and not on the horizontal. Our focus, our heart's attention to be upon him and nothing else that is around us. Nothing cripples our walk of faith any more than all of the earthly and human crutches that we lean upon. These crutches cause us to look at what we can do for ourselves and what others can do for us. In the end, although those props will fail and our guys gaze should be cast on heaven, when we lean upon the unfailing prop of God himself, we can be sure that he'll always bring us through. I love to listen to the testimonies of those who lived through the times of the Depression and how there was no government support and no help, but they said the only thing we had to help was what God had given us, and the support that he had provided for us. We had absolutely nothing else. We do thank the Lord for the supports that he does give, but we need to remember that at best these supports are temporary. They are temporal. People, positions, powers, they will eventually fail. But if we learn to lean solely upon the Lord, he will never fail. Hebrews 13.5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have, for he hath said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now that's a crutch that I'm saying, that's a support that I'm saying, that I'm leaning upon. And he says, I'm in such a position of life that you have looked to other things which will fail. But I, on the contrary, am sitting in such a place in relationship to you that I cannot leave you and I cannot forsake you. It's not easy to take, but it's the truth. When the Lord finds us leaning on everything else but instead of him, it will be a painful process of dismantling those support systems. He wants our undivided attention. He wants our undivided allegiance. And slowly as his children come along, he says, yes, I've placed this with you and I've given this to you in order that you would learn to grow. But you have to realize that I've given this to you. And if I choose to remove it, it's been my choice. It's how I work in order that you would learn to trust in me. He does this not to harm us, but to help us to learn to lean on him and him alone. Now, did David learn the support system? Look at Psalm 34, and there are just a few of these verses. Actually, the entire psalm is quite adequate in describing uh, David's response to what God has, in essence, done to him over a period of time. David's mental state and his life has been tempered in the furnace of affliction. It's been shaped upon the anvil of providence. And David has learned to completely lean upon the Lord. Um, let me just pick a few of these verses out. Look at verse 4. He says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Where do fears arise from? They arise from the unknown, from the removal of those things that we had put confidence in, trust in, uh, allegiance in, and when those things were removed, we say, how can I be supported? They've left me. I'm, I'm, I have nothing to lean upon. David here, he's come to the place in his life, and he says, I did look for the Lord. He did hear me. He did deliver me from all my fears. When the supports were removed, God was there. Um, Verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. That's experience, isn't it? Taste and see. It's not a matter of taking my word for it, but experience the things that God provides. Look what he's done. Taste and see the goodness of God. Blessed is the blessings come to the one who finds shelter, refuge, 
to be able to be hidden in this one who has experienced these blessings. Verse 10, the young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. The young lions, the strength of the time. Uh, I don't even, I guess there are probably lions in a zoo or something over there. But in a place where lions used to be prevalent, you know, that was the power. And now he says, uh, those who look to the Lord, seek him, will not have any lack of any good thing. 15 and 16. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. The face of the Lord is against them that do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Every righteous one, everyone who's learned and loved and has this relationship, God says his ears are open to them. But to those who are not, he says they've been cut off. Uh, one more, verse 18. The Lord is near, the Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save as such that be of a contrite spirit. What's the relationship of the one who's been broken, who's had the crutches pulled out, who's, who's all the things that have been leaned upon, and, and there's just nothing left that this earth has to offer? He says, I'm there. He says, he is near to the broken heart. He saves such that are of a contrite spirit humbled spirit. What a marvelous transition from this young man. He says, well, David is a man like unto God's own heart. Well, God did work in him in such a way that David responded to the hand of God. And he comes from the field as a shepherd, and he's built up, and he's trained, and he's put in positions of responsibility. And then all of a sudden, knocked out, and he finds himself down, but his response is there because he's sensitive to God's call. He says, Lord, you haven't left me. These are the things that I've learned. These are the promises that you've provided. These are the blessings that are mine to keep. The leaning business hits pretty close to home for all of us. We've all been knocked down when we've, had, we've lost a crutch, when we've lost a cane, when we've lost something that we've leaned on in our life. And if you haven't, there will be a time. They will come and they will come again. There'll be plenty of times I find my own self leaning upon this thing or that or this person or that person instead of the Lord. And it's easy to do. When it's an easier path, when it's something that I've been successful at and I can do it again because I've done it before myself, that's something I'm leaning on rather than leaning upon the Lord. But I've also found that when I've leaned too hard on things in life, God systematically and painfully removes that crutch from me. And I say painfully because it's kind of grown on me, and it should never have happened. That is where he plans to work with each and every one of us. When God begins to dismantle this support system, it can be painful, but it's not something that we should fear because he is doing something in our lives. He's merely growing us and teaching us something that we all need to learn, that he is all sufficient, that he has all that we need, that he is our gracious supply. He is almighty and he will never fail us to leave us or let us down. He wants us to learn this truth and when we have that support system of the earth will never be needed again. And I think that's the difference between what we would perceive as the great men and women of God and those who are still struggling in, in immature situations. Those that we look in the scriptures and say, how, oh, they must have something special. No, I think they've learned to slowly become, lean their trust in leaning upon the Lord more and more and more each day. That's what he's developing in us. And um, those are the, the truths of found within David, and I trust can be found within us. Shall we pray? Father, look upon us with favor tonight. In the quietness of this uh, moment, there are things that we have learned in our life to lean upon. And they've been placed there by your gracious hand. Uh, thank you for people and organizations. Thank you for abilities 
and skills and talents. Thank you for things of interest and things that we've found that we're good at. But Lord, may they never become substitutes for you. May we never find ourselves trusting in them more than our trust is in you. And if need be, Father, remove them. Remove them in order that we would learn such a lesson that you have not left your children abandoned on their own, but they are to learn to lean upon you wholeheartedly and completely in life. We're sorry for the times that we've, we've bumbled through life and accused you of not thinking of us, not loving us, not caring for us. When all along the struggles of life the conflicts with the circumstances that we found ourselves in has just been another loving way for you to bring us to maturity. Thank you for your word because it's replete with the examples of men and women who have done the very same thing successfully, been drawn closer to you, have been developed and matured in ways that we so desire to be too. We know the same spirit that works in them is working in us. Be patient with us, Lord. Be gracious and be merciful. Forgive us, Father, where we have erred, and cause us, Father, to learn to love you, lean upon you more and more each day. And we pray it in our Savior's name. Amen.